Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to welcome you to today's meeting of Ethics, Ethics at the Frontiers of Science. Uh, for those of you who don't know, my name is Larry Hinman, and I'm in the philosophy department here. Um, we are truly uh, delighted and honored to have our guest speaker today, is, uh, Dr. Floyd Bloom. Uh, Floyd is at the Scripps Research Institute. Uh, he has been a leader in the area of neurosciences uh, for many years. Um, he has been the past president of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the editor uh, of the journal Science, and, uh, with, you know, and really been a leader in the area of neuroscience and ethics. So it's just with a great pleasure and an honor to welcome Dr. Ford. It's a pleasure to be part of your course. I've gotten to know Larry through our mutual service on the San Diego Center for Ethics and Science and Technology that Mike Kalishman runs. Um, and through my service on the President's Council on Bioethics, which is a job I took on last year, uh, I've gotten more and more interested in exploring this area that we'll talk about this afternoon. So I come at this from the perspective of being a scientist and the roles that scientists have in helping new scientists understand why ethics are important in the conduct of science. Much of my experience comes from being editor of Journal Science. It gets about 12,000 submittals a year. The main job is just opening the envelopes so the people can <laughs> Finding good reviewers, trying to interest people in publishing there, trying to determine what it is that makes a good reviewer of a scientific journal. We won't talk about any of those issues this afternoon. What I'm going to talk about are covered in these points. I'm going to first um, tell you a little bit about the field of neuroethics as I understand it. I'll tell you a little bit about the President's Council on Bioethics. And we'll talk about some past ethical issues that we don't think about in terms of modern neuroethics, but are very much a part of the past history of the field of neuroscience. Then I try to interest you a little bit in what's hot in neuroscience research relevant to ethics. And then lastly, I'm going to go into the articles that you've probably already read and understood from Larry that you're reading from Mike Kazanica's book, The Ethical Brain. He raises several issues. Um, yesterday's issue of the New York Times Magazine was had its cover article devoted to neuroscience and the law. Uh, I think many of the concerns that are raised are interesting. Some of them are actually discussable, and others, in my view, are close to fantasy issues that will never come to pass. Figuring out how to distinguish between those is what's part of the fun of the system. Now, obviously, you don't know very much about neuroscience. So neuroscience is field of research that really didn't even have a name until the early 1970s. Before then, people looked at the biochemistry of the brain, or the structure of the brain, or the physiology of the brain, or the outputs of the brain, that is, behavior between animals and between people. Uh, when the Society for Neuroscience was formed, it got rid of a problem, which was that those separate fields, all working on the brain in some way, didn't really understand each other's language and didn't talk to each other. But the Society for Neuroscience, which was formed in 1971, rendered that an inoperable barrier. And now that people share a common language, a, a finding in one field can be readily applied to the findings in others. And it's been a very exciting field of research. Um, it's grown incrementally 10% a year for now more than 37 years. Um, I think San Diego has had more presidents in the Society for Neuroscience there five living presidents of the Society for Neuroscience who live in San Diego, and two of them are dead. In addition to those core disciplines, there's a lot of other things that you can be engaged in that apply to the field of neuroscience. Chemistry, mathematics, computer sciences, physics, biophysics, clinical neurosciences, psychiatry, neurology, ophthalmology, ENT, are all part of neurosciences. In addition, philosophy is a part of neuroscience. And at UC San Diego, Patricia Churchland and her husband, Dr. Churchland, are, are among the mainstays of the philosophy issues in neuroscience. One of the hottest areas, and mainly what we're going to talk about this afternoon, are the cognitive neurosciences. 
what do we mean by consciousness, which is a major, major issue in trying to figure out how do you do that scientifically? Um, what is the basis for language? What is the basis for abstract thought? Music would be one of those abstract kinds of thoughts. What is the basis for creativity? Those are all issues that neuroscience would like to grapple with, but some of them are not feasible to grapple with because we don't know how to do that kind of research. <coughs> that aspect of cognitive neuroscience has generated a, a few subfields, one of which is neuroethics. Now again, if you haven't had neurosciences yet, what you really need to know is that every part of the brain has at least one name, so some of them have several names, if you ever get engaged in it, you'll learn the vocabularies that go with them. But within the brain, specific functions are highly specifically and reproducibly organized. So the motor cortex will always be in front of a little sulcus called the central sulcus, and the sensory cortex will always be right behind it. Now that's important to know because it helps us understand that when we look at a picture of the brain cells, the nerve cells, the neurons, and understand that they talk to each other chemically, the messages are carried over long distance through very organized pathways or circuits, as we like to call them. And it's through those chemical communication points, the synapses, that nerve cells talk to each other and organize the information processing of the brain. So we talked about the disciplines that went into the field of neuroscience. It's also important to recognize that when you talk about neuroscience, you can talk about it at many levels of resolution, from the molecular to the cells, the systems that are composed of those specific cells to the output of the brain, which is behavior. Now, at the risk of getting more information than you want about the brain at this stage of your careers, let me just tell you that as mammals, we have about 40,000 genes. And more than half of those genes are genes that are used by the nervous system. Now, I've written several books on the brain, and if you add up all the words in the index of all the books I've ever read or written, you don't come up to 2,000. So if you're daunted by what looks like a lot of knowledge, what you should realize is that more than half of the genes that the brain uses have not yet even been discovered. So just to put that information into perspective, it's specific genes that specific neurons express that allow them to seek out and respond to the neurons that they'll be connected to the circuits of the adult brain. Those interconnected circuits represent the systems that allow us to hold ourselves constant no matter what the environment is. It's very warm outside, it's very cold here in the air conditioning. You don't need special commands to learn to dilate the pores in your skin or to raise your hairs on your hair follicles when you're trying to keep a layer of warm around your body. It's all done automatically for you. It's all done unconsciously for you. It's homeostasis. When you're thirsty and it reflects the differences in your salt and water balance, you don't need to learn anything special to know that you have to get something to drink right away. When the environment threatens those cellular systems, the genes can turn on or off and allow the cells and the systems and the circuits all to adapt. And as long as they can compensate, everything remains healthy. But when the demands of the environment exceed the ability of the adaptive systems to compensate, homeostasis gets lost. And that's what we talk about as brain diseases. And there are many, many brain diseases. Now, you're going to try to remember what I said to you, either by taking notes or looking at Larry's website after this lecture is over. What you need to know is that there are many kinds of memory. It's not just one kind of factual memory, which is what you're going through now. There's also the memory for performance, <coughs> playing golf, playing football, which your campus seems to do very, very well, at least last year. There's all kinds of sensory motor adaptations, including being able to play musical instruments. There are the things that you're already conditioned to, which is life on this hilltop, which requires no special learning skills at all. And you'll remember it for long after you've left. But there's also the specific kind of high order memory in which you can recount, both in your own mind and to your friends who were there, the good times you had in a specific location at a specific time. That goes by the lovely name, episodic memory. And it's one of the highest forms of memory. As far as we know, only human beings have that kind of memory. And it's one of the kinds of memories that goes quick, most quickly in diseases like Alzheimer's disease. Now, I said we would try to <coughs> understand enough about the field to understand what consciousness means. And I'll go into it just very, very slightly. 
Um, if, if Dr. Edelman ever comes to your course to talk, the students will get a, a, a full-blown whiff of what it really means to understand consciousness. But if you take the parts of the brain, we won't go into their names, there's some that are concerned with recognizing aspects of you, your internal milieu, your physical stature, your comfort, your level of awakeness. And there are other parts that don't deal with you, but deal with you in the world around you, the non-self parts. When those are integrated, that information is fed back over and over and over again. And it allows us to maintain an awareness of ourselves in the world, which is kind of a simplified way of thinking what we mean by consciousness. You're not just zombies sitting in the chair and taking notes automatically. You are aware of being in this classroom at this time, next to that person, or taking notes. That, that is what we mean by consciousness. It's one of the highest orders of problems that we're trying to solve in the neuroscience. <clears throat> so what do we mean then by neuroethics? William Sapphire, who is the writer also for the Sunday Times magazine, and the chairman of the board of the Dana Foundation, find neuroethics as the field of philosophy that discusses the rights and wrongs of the treatment or enhancement of the human brain. And while that is true, I don't think it's a complete enough definition because as I will try to show you, not only does neuroethics try to deal with that, it also tries to deal with the neuroscience of where and how we as an individual and we as a society make ethical decisions. And what we do when those parts of the brain, where and how, we make ethical, moral decisions don't operate properly that we get into trouble with the law, which is a lot of what yesterday's article in the New York Times was all about. Dr. S uh, Sapphire led the first real book in this area. It was called Neuroethics Mapping the Field. It was a conference held in 2002. And you can download that if you want to read it from the Dana Foundation website. That's dana.org, dana.org. When I was president at AAAS, we convened a meeting of the special committee of the American Association for the Advancement of Sciences and the American Bar Association that specifically wanted to look now at what problems new discoveries in neuroscience might have as far as the legal system goes. And if that's at all interesting to you, you can get a copy of that book from the AAAS website. You're reading Mike Kazaniga's book, The Ethical Brain, which in a very humorous and, and very lucid manner, raises some of these issues. And he and I, I, I would say, are, are pretty much on the same track, although he has a little bit more confidence in some discoveries being made than I do. And lastly, if you want to find out some specific information about neuroethics, the most straightforward one is just go to Wikipedia and enter neuroethics. It'll link you to all of the current websites that are out there. Of all of those, the two that I found very interesting or the one at the University of Pennsylvania called neuroethics.upenn.eu. And the one from CBHD, that stands for the Center for Bioethics and Human Dignity. And their website has a special column on neuroethics. It's only appeared three times so far. But they're all very provocative, very interesting, and might make good matter for your future discussions, of course. The Journal of Bioethics is proclaimed that in 2007 it's going to have three special issues all devoted to neuroethics. They don't tell us what the articles are going to be. That will be an interesting thing to see. Now, uh, let me segue into the President's Council on Bioethics. The President's Council on Bioethics is about the fifth such council that's been created since biomedical technology became very powerful and to some people very threatening. Um, it is created to advise the president on bioethical issues that may emerge as a consequence of advances in biomedical sciences and technology. And it's supposed to specifically deal with these five issues. Fundamental inquiries into the moral significance of developments in science and technology. The ethical and policy questions related to these developments. It's supposed to provide a forum for a national discussion. And while I'm thinking of it, all of the transcripts of all of the meetings are on the web virtually within days after the meetings occur. So if you really would like to be on the President's Council for Bioethics but don't want to go to Washington, D.C., you can relive all of those meetings, which I find very painful to do. <laughs> Facilitate a greater understanding of bioethical issues by the reports that I'll show you in a moment, and explore the possibilities for useful international collaboration. I think that's the one area that really has not been pursued in depth, at least in the meetings I've been to so far. The 
the Franklin Sharing. The first report, July 2002, on human cloning and human dignity is perhaps the best well-known of all of the reports that the Council has issued. Um, as new ideas for creating stem cells have, a, have occurred, they've augmented that information with a supplemental report. They have explored in vitro fertilization and all the various ways to aid reproduction. They've issued a book of readings on what it means about being human. Um, and it's a very interesting book indeed. Um, beyond Therapy looks at ways to enhance the brain and the body beyond special conditions. Current efforts of the Council are focused on how to decide ethical ways to allocate a rather sparse supply of organs for organ transplantation. Also deals with brain death and how to call it so you know when the organs are available for transplantation. Um, the first report, the Human Cloning and Human Dignity, is a very interesting report, but it never defines what human dignity really is. The book about being human uses the term human dignity many times, but never defines what human dignity really is. When I went to the Salk Institute, when I first moved to San Diego, I had the study of Jacob Bronowski who has a book called Human Science and Human Dignity. And he never defines what human dignity is as well. So recognizing this small gap in our intellectual history, there's a volume being prepared now that deals with philosophers' views of what human dignity are. And there's a very wide range. Of and lastly, we're beginning to explore the opportunities that understanding the human genome, both in health and disease, can have on preventing diseases in the future and preventing them means part of what's called genomic medicine, recognizing the genes that make you vulnerable and taking up the lifestyle that will help you avoid them. So let's spend a few minutes about things that weren't called neuroethics because nobody knew what neuroethics was in those days. But nevertheless, rather <coughs> glaring errors in our understanding of science and its implications. I'll start with phrenology. Phrenology really starts with Descartes. Descartes, who was working in the middle of the 17th century, didn't think the brain had anything to do with mental function. He thought that all the action was in the ventricles of the brain. And then when the light or sound came in, it went immediately to the ventricles, bounced off the pineal gland, and from the pineal gland activated the pathways that caused you to move in space. Now, a big change occurred when localization of function in the brain started to occur, mainly as a result of bullet. With bullets, you could finally injure somebody's brain and not kill them. So you can make a small hole, better than big cancers, better than big strokes. Small holes from bullets really did a lot to localize the function of the parts of the brain, including that motor and sensory strip that I mentioned to you at the beginning of the talk. A man named Franz Joseph Gall, who was a Viennese physician, decided that if you could localize sensory and motor, maybe you could localize other aspects of the brain's function. So he developed a technology that he called organology, which was basically to palpate the scalp and then do a very in-depth personality examination of the person and decide which of their qualities reflected the little organs of their brain. That every, he had 27 organs of the brain. And depending on whether he could feel a bump or a non-bump, he decided whether that little organ of your brain was or was not here to provide superior performance in that particular virtue. He worked with another Viennese physician who decided that he didn't want to be part of Gall's organology routine, and so he created his own list of 35, which then became known as phrenology. In phrenology, the extreme localization of brain and personality functions by palpating the scalp was decried by physicians the world over and started a social reform movement in which people thought they could decide who was a criminal, who was unteachable, who was superior and should be elite, simply based on the quality of the bumps that they had. It took decades for that to go away. Most of the time, you see one of these maps, you can't read the words that are on there, but if anyone's interested, just let Larry know and I'll send you a reference where you can see all 35 of the organs of the brain that these people thought they could do. Now, let's deal with a few more. Pellagra. It's a disease caused by vitamin deficiency of a vitamin called niacin, vitamin B3. 
Vitamin B3 wasn't really identified until nearly 1940. But during the 1910s and 20s, it caused pellagra, the disease, caused people in the southeastern parts of the United States to go mad. And the major cause of asylum imprisonment was from this vitamin deficiency. And it was caused by the fact that when people in the United States, before it was the United States, when, when the first Jamestown colony came to this country and they took corn from the Indians, they didn't follow the Indians' rules for how to eat the corn. The Indians always took the kernels of corn and put them in a light solution of lime, a very alkaline substance. The alkaline substance, unbeknownst to them, made it a very healthful vitamin-giving vegetable. But when it was exported, subsequent people gave up on that because they didn't understand the purpose of treating it with lime and they thought it gave it a funny taste. In the southeastern United States, they practically lived off of a corn diet. The corn diet led to four major symptoms, a reddish dermatitis, diarrhea, dementia, and ultimately death. When the Public Health Service said this must be caused by a diet, the senators from the southeastern United States rose up in arms saying it can't possibly be, it must be a toxin in the air. And a very famous public health epidemiologist named Joseph Goldberger went to the prisons of South Carolina, used the prisons as guinea pigs, and showed that you can induce plague with bad diets and cure it with good diets. Frontal lobotomy is a nasty psychic operation in which the originator, Dr. Agis, drilled holes in the skull, inserted a scalpel, and disconnected the frontal lobes from the rear of the brain. It was used to treat bad behavior from schizophrenia to manic depressive disease. The medical world was very mixed. Dr. Agis was given the Nobel Prize in 1949 for this operation, but Physician after physician decried the fact that it was overused. It was given in 1950 alone to more than 10,000 people. One of Senator, uh, former President Kennedy's sisters was given a frontal lobotomy. As a result of this, she stayed as a recluse for the rest of her life. Finally, in the 1960s and 70s, this operation was outlawed. But I worked in the NIH at the St. Elizabeth's Hospital, where a physician named Walter Freeman decided that it took too long to drill the holes around the brain and disconnect the frontal lobes. And instead, he invented a method in which he took an ice pick and a wooden mallet and shoved the ice pick through the thin bone at the base of the roof of your ocular orbit. And through that one hole, he could then swing the ice pick back and forth, and he could do 100 patients a day. Great advances in that. <coughs> Almost as bad as the field of giving adrenal transplants and fetal dopamine cells into the brains of people with Parkinson's disease. Since everybody has two adrenal medullas, you can spare one. The cells of the adrenal medulla make the neurotransmitter that's missing in Parkinson's disease. And so by in principle putting these cells into the brains of people with Parkinson's disease, you can allow them to be partially cured even if they don't take any medication. Now, it initially was only done anecdotally, but in not so long ago, actually, about eight years ago, a group of 60 patients were treated in this way at medical centers across the United States. And while they initially did very, very well, after a while, the transplants became autonomous, and the patients suffered from excess of the missing neurotransmitter. And so they had a disease that was even worse than the Parkinson's disease for which they were no longer responsible for treatment. Let me just do one other thing for you with all of these wonderful things of our past. The Silver Spring Monkeys were a group of animals in whom scientists severed the sensory nerves either to the fingers or to the hand or to the arm or to the leg to try to understand how it was that sensory information could modify motor performance, as in somebody who's had a stroke. And you may have heard today of the restraint method of treating somebody, you take the good arm and keep it from moving so that you're forced to move the bad arm. <coughs> Some people's views that accelerates the recovery from a stroke. 
Well, these Silver Spring monkeys gave rise to the people for the ethical treatment of animals because one particular animal handler believed that the animals were not able to take care of themselves. And so they made movies that were shown on early television. It was first decided by an appellate court and later by the Supreme Court that this was an appropriate experiment to have been done. But the animals were kept alive for nearly 10 years when they had only been intended to stay alive for less than two. And one of the major findings of that was that in the absence of the sensory information from the arm that had been denervated, the maps of the brain in that sensory column that I showed you in the brain reorganized themselves. So normally, if you try to map the surface of your body to the surface of your brain, things like your hands are very big. Your hand area represents a very large part of your sensory map. But in animals where that sensory information from the hand is no longer there, the face area had expanded. So that now the animals were able to feel their environment through sensory receptors on their face. And this experiment was not only an astounding one for most scientists, it created the view that even as adults, our brains are capable of extraordinary synaptic plasticity. So if you play the piano or the violin, your hand areas will be even larger than the hand areas of people who don't play musical instruments. And it also means that there's a chance for inducing recovery by finding out what controls that plasticity and being able to help people recover. I won't mention tobacco or alcohol or fen fen, all of which are fads in our society which at various times the government has approved of and draws taxes from, and at other times has decided are bad for you until society raises up and says that they want it anyway. <laughs> so uh, I'll just give you a couple of recent neuroscience advances which take us forward from this point. The biggest one raised in all of these issues of being threatened by neuroscience's implications for ethics and the law is the ability to see the brain in operation. There are several ways to do that. The two most common are called positron emission tomography, where a, a special kind of glucose is labeled that you can see with a special imaging device called a positron, very similar to a CAT scan, but it allows you to see exactly where, with a limited resolution, that's, that's going on. And here's the way the experiment was done. The investigator puts the person in the device, administers the glucose, and the glucose will go to wherever the brain cells are most active. And this scale of activity means that places that are red and yellow have the most activity, places that are blue have the least activity. So when the person is instructed to look at a word projected on the screen on the wall, the visual parts of the brain light up. When they hear that word pronounced by an external voice, the auditory parts of the brain light up. When they are asked to read the word that's there, the speech area lights up. And when they're asked to think of synonyms for the word that they saw on the screen or heard being said, they generate activity in the frontal part of the brain. Now these are done by a technique called subtractive imaging. So you take away all the places that were a lot hot when they were seeing the animal and look for those that turned on when you heard it where you take away all the parts that were there for seeing and hearing, and then say which ones light up anew when it's speaking, et cetera. And that technology, and complemented by another one called functional magnetic resonance imaging, are based on really what's going on inside the brain. So I, I told you the places where brain cells communicate with each other are called synapses. This is a sending side of the synapse. This is the receiving side of the synapse. All the synapses are supported by a, a non-neural cell called an astrocyte, which is really the missing link between the glucose and oxygen in your bloodstream and the restoration required to keep that synapse at homeostatic functional status. So when this synapse is active, the glia have to give energy to the astrocyte. They pull glucose out of the bloodstream, they pull oxygen out of the bloodstream, and you can now see which parts of the brain have been activated by whatever that behavioral code is. Another technology that's used and which causes great consternation for some legal and ethical experts is called the P300 test. This is an EEG test in which the EEG is synchronized with a computer and the computer starts the clock going when a particular sensory vision or sound is portrayed. So here we're looking at a face, a car, 
abstract design, a blank sheet with a word on it, or just a blank sheet. And what you can see is that when this subject sees a face and knows who that face is, a special potential, that's the line in red, comes at about 300 milliseconds after the face was presented. If you don't know who that person is, you may as well be looking at a car, unless it's your car, and if you recognize those dents on the front bumper is yours, you'll have a P300 there. Now, you can't control this. You can't turn it off. It's there. Just by the process of recognizing something familiar to you, a P300 is generated, and that tells us that you're aware of the context and meaning of that particular image. So using either positron emission tomography or functional magnetic resonance imaging, it's possible to do some very interesting tricks with the brain and see what lights up. So in this particular experiment, people were in the device measuring their brain's activity and observing on a mirrored screen another person performing a movement. After they watched it for a while, and you can see here the visual parts of the brain are lit up, but none of the motor parts are lit up. After they observed it for a while, they were thought to just close their eyes and imagine that they were doing the same movement that they just saw being done. And now the activity changes from being in the visual parts of the brain to being in the parts of the brain just in front of the motor strip, as though the motor strip were going through mental acts of imagining how you would do that particular movement. And this experiment was done almost 15 years ago. Today we call these neurons that light up when you're imagining doing something as mirror neurons. And when you see somebody coming towards you, even though you don't consciously dissect their status, their friendliness, their aggressiveness, their physical attitude, your brain is analyzing that person on approach and trying to decide whether that's a peaceful approach or a non-peaceful approach, also done through, through mirror neurons. Here's an, a very interesting experiment that, that I used at the MIT meeting on neuroethics two years ago. It just came out in Science Magazine at that time. And this is a, a, a very high-tech experiment. It involved two functional magnetic resonance imagers, one in Pasadena and one in Houston. And they were playing a game. One of the people was called an investor. And that person had a certain amount of token money that he could give to the trustee. And when the trustee accepted what was offered, then they both got to split part of the kitty. So the trick is for the investor to decide how little he can give the person he's giving it to that they won't deny it, in which case neither one of them got anything. Or that the person would accept it, in which case both of them would eventually do it. <coughs> And when the investor had a trusting person in the other machine, a new part of the brain lit up right there called the caudate nucleus, which they claim then is the site in which trust is developed in your brain. All right, so you get the picture. By looking at the brain in operation, even wordlessly, you can create an image of where things are going wrong. Marcus Rakel, who's one of the lead investigators in this area of research, has talked about the brain's dark energy. What is it that our brains are doing when we don't think we're doing anything? Well, what we're doing is reliving events, trying to remember that girl's name or her telephone number, things that are not necessarily factual information, but are emotional anticipation of the events that may occur to you in the world. And there are just literally dozens of these papers. What parts of the brain are lit up in early stage intense romantic love? What part of the brain is lit up when you're making the decision to give a gift to charity? <laughs> what part of the brain is working when you're trying to understand what we mean by working memory, keeping that task in mind while you try to memorize that poem? What are we doing in our brains when we try to understand what we will be doing tomorrow, or a month from now, or two years from now? Certain parts of the brain will light up for those things. And lastly, we'll talk about how and where does moral judgment come into this. Now, I'll just mention briefly that Consciousness can be broken down into several categories of study, some of which are more studyable than others. Uh, amongst the more studyable is the issue of whether you recognize yourself in the mirror. All human beings, particularly girls, recognize themselves in the mirror. But it turns out that other animals can recognize themselves 
as well. Dolphins, elephants, some higher primates, but not necessarily rhesus monkeys. Self-recognition often goes with another trait called altruism, which means the willingness to do something good for another person, even if you're not related to them. And while humans do that quite a lot, dogs do that, elephants do that, dolphins do that, many, many recorded cases in which altruism is there. So this aspect of consciousness is not necessarily a human-only kind of trait. Self-detection, which is an introspective way of looking at your own emotional status at the moment, that is something that we think of is mainly a human function. The awareness of others, the ability to go back in time and to remember specific semantic episodes that occurred is highly thought to be a function of others. And the awareness of being aware, which is what I sort of try to define as the earliest form of consciousness, also sometimes referred to as theory of the mind, is something that we think is uniquely human being. And I'll just point this out because I think it's an area that has only just begun to surface that is going to be very, very exciting. And that's the ability to use a computer, analyze the EEG while a person is doing something, and then dissect backwards in time as to what the brain was doing when it made the decision to move that act. And without going into a lot of detail, what has been possible to do is with both monkeys, human beings, and rats is to analyze their EEG and to have them navigate a maze on an electronic screen simply by thinking, without moving through it, by decoding the electron cell So it's a, something if you'd ask me, is that possible, I would have said no. But it is possible, and it has been done very, very reproducibly. Um, if you're interested in this at all, the December Scientific American has a beautiful article on how this goes about. And what it means is that for human beings who are locked into their brain because of stroke or injury or paralysis, it is now possible for them to communicate by thinking of the words they want to spell out on the computer screen, by thinking of the letters that they want a typewriter to type. It's a tremendous breakthrough. Now let's move on to really what Larry wanted me to talk about and how I phrased the title of what I would talk about. How, how real are the ethical threats from and to neuroscience. And I, I picked out these seven areas to talk about just a little bit. The general science of neuroscience really has to be a, a supremely ethical kind of research to be conducted. Because working with animals, the responsible use of animals in our research, is a critical part of what we've learned to understand. The new techniques that I've demonstrated to you all came from animal research. In order for us to understand what we are doing, we create new animals by manipulating their genes, which change their brains, which change their behavior. If we ever want to understand what Alzheimer's is all about, what depression or schizophrenia are all about, we need to be able to transpose those genes into animals and to be able to dissect them appropriately. So that's a very critical aspect of, of ethics in this field. The ability to study healthy human beings in laboratory settings gives rise to the techniques that allow us to then apply them to individuals with diminished mental capacity. But here's where we start to get into ethical dilemmas at least. Who decides whether a person with diminished mental capacity can be a subject for a clinical trial? Patients with Alzheimer's disease whose caregivers want them to be treated have to make that decision for them. So they have a mixed approach to it. Do I want them to be treated and live longer with this demented state? Do I want to try to see if their brain is recoverable? So we need ethical ways to decide when to apply a treatment, particularly a non-risky treatment, to a person with diminished mental capacity. The same would be true for autism. The same would be true for mild forms of mental retardation, where there may be some hope that you could do something. Another thorny issue that arises is whether the patients who are involved in the research should be part of the intellectual property of the people who develop the technique and devise the device and sell it to be able to make a lot of money. And there are no rules for this, so it's entrepreneurialism to the forefront as to who gets included in the contract for the cost of proceeds. Now let's talk about restoring the diseased brain, which is one of the things they talk about in yesterday's article. One is we've talked about a little bit, that is to say, transplanting things into the brain to help the diseased brain be restored. 
It has a high number of proponents. One of the major issues in the stem cell campaign that we had here in California was Mrs. Reagan saying before the president died that we only had stem cells for President Reagan with that dog. I don't think that's true. Uh, I think that the time between now and you can use stem cells to treat anything in the brain occurs would be a very, very long time. But there are at least two companies here in San Diego that are devising ways to transplant genes into cells in the brain to be able to overcome the inability to find stem cells that can replace brain cells. We've talked about the person with diminished capacity. Remember Christopher Reeves, the former Superman, who, who lay in his paralyzed body for a long, long time. That kind of person brings up the issue of what can a desperate person really agree to as far as treatment for a lethal and, as far as we know, non-recoverable kind of disorder. It brings into very prominent play the issue of what we mean by human dignity. How long can a human decide whether they want to live or not? We've seen the movies and read the books about people with quadriplegia. Whose body is it anyway? Whose life is it anyway? When do I have the right to decide, even though my brain is alive and functioning, that I want to die? Uh, the same thing comes up in reverse when the brain is bad and the body is good. Now, as long as you're breathing normally, I remember the case from two years ago, where the person seemed to be able to have visual reflexes and to breathe on her own, and yet the doctor decided that her brain was unrecoverable and never going to come back. Very thorny ethical issue in this field. Let's think about prenatal genetic diagnosis. Prenatal genetic diagnosis, in principle, is able to eliminate currently untreatable genetic diseases. So things like Tay-Sachs disease or Huntington's disease could, in principle, be analyzed in the prenatal embryo, eight-cell stage embryo. And the decision not to continue that pregnancy could be used to eliminate that particular disease. For the most part, society has resisted that. In the Ashkenazi community, where Tay-Sachs disease was once prominent, Tay-Sachs disease is what's called a recessive disease. So just having one copy of the gene isn't good, but having two copies will give you the disease. And so in that community, what they did was to do the gene test on people in their adolescence, keep the information secret until they decided who they wanted to marry, and then decode the information. And if both of them happened to be recessive for this gene, then they would urge them publicly not to get married or not to have children. Now, in vitro fertilization is already being used to select the gender of the unborn child. It is possible, and this bothers a lot of ethicists, that you could select ultimately for traits well beyond just gender, physical prowess, intelligence. The problem is we don't have any gene markers to know whether you've got it or you don't got it. Um, and, and you probably know from your brother or your sister that just because they look stupid when they were a child, doesn't mean they're going to grow up to be that way. So there's a lot of things that you can do to out-train what the genes that give you, particularly if you're obsessed with being moody on the Notre Dame football team. <laughs> now, there are people who start you down the slippery slope of saying, well, someday we may be able to predict whether this is going to be a smart person or not, so then we can send them to either university or technical school when they're an adolescent. And this is one of those things I think is, is hysteria. I don't think we'll ever have the markers that will allow us to confine someone's, constrain someone's intellectual opportunities on the basis of a gene test, whether it's a gene test or functional imaging. Let's move on to brain as a truth sale. I showed you the P300 wave that you can't control whether you give a P300 or not. If you recognize that face, you're going to have a P300. So the FBI wants to use this as a way of identifying terrorist colleagues. There is a group that called this method brain fingerprinting that claims this is the ultimate lie detector. The scientists are very much against this implication, um, even though fingerprinting has barely been allowed into court proceedings. Lie detectors have never been allowed into court proceedings, even though the criminal investigations division used them to try to intimidate suspects. We see that on CSI virtually every night. But scientists don't believe that everyone can tell the truth. 
And there's a lot of reasons for that. One is a lot of faces look the same, so how do you know if that's exactly the face that you saw? We were even watching when you saw that face. We were paying attention to it. P300 wave that, that shows that test can be falsely applied. You may think you recognize that face when you don't. And I showed you there were many kinds of memory. And the kind of memory that's most difficult to remember is that episodic semantic memory. You were being held up. You only got a fleeting look at the person who had the gun on you all the time, hoping they wouldn't pull the trigger on that gun. And now you're going to be asked to identify that person standing with six other people in a different room under different conditions. Well, people who were there and watched it can't tell the same story as to what happened. The same person retelling the story on different occasions can't remember exactly what happened. So eyewitness testimony is highly fallacious. And some people think that it's really not applicable to the system. I showed you those multiple forms of memory, so we won't go through that again. You remember that many cases, particularly in nursery schools, of false suggestibility, where the counselor suspecting that child abuse had gone on, talked to the children who finally remembered, yes, in fact, they had been abused. And then you'll remember the court cases of maybe three or four years ago, in which young women suddenly remembered that their father had abused them 35 years before. And some of these people were sent to prison on the basis of this, and there's no way to prove or disprove that kind of allegation. But the brain is highly suggestible. When you're reading Mike Kazaniga's books, if you look for the part that deals with the split brain patients, you'll see that the left side of your brain really wants to make a story out of all the facts that the left and right side of your brain are doing. So they, no matter what, how obscure and how irrelevant the facts are, the left brain will try to make a story out of it. A lot of people think that's what's happening when false memories suggest to a person. Now, it talks in the New York Times article yesterday about irresistible impulses as being an excuse for excluding someone from criminal liability. Um, the example I like to use as, as an analogy is suppose you're red colorblind. Does that allow you to run red lights, have traffic accidents, and kill people? No, it doesn't. You learn early in your life that you can't see red, but that you know the light at the top of those three is the one that you've got to pay attention to. It's your responsibility to do it. So I think that the brain as a truth sayer is very overestimated by the ethicists who find problems in neuroscience. Is it possible, asked the New York Times yesterday, to capture brain images of chronic neck pain that is claimed by people who are, being, who are suing their insurance companies for compensation? And some claims to have suffered, but it's really not in pain. Well, it is possible. I think it will be possible to do that. Whether you can get the insurance companies to pay for the treatment, to, to pay for the analysis, I think is more questionable. Do sexual offenders and violent teenagers show unusual patterns of brain activity? Here, my answer to you would be that it's very much like genes for cancers that make you more vulnerable, but don't necessarily mean you're going to have the cancer. Yes, teenagers show abnormal activity. They show abnormal activity in their bodies, and they show abnormal activity in their brains. Does that mean that it makes them criminally liable? I don't think we know enough to be able to discriminate those two possibilities. Now let's talk about predicting adult life courses. This, this is something that the philosophers and ethicists are worried about. If you had the right brain test that showed that when you were 40 or 50, you were going to be vulnerable to depression. Who would you allow to know that? And what is your right as an individual to keep something that's discovered incidentally when you go for an exam for something that's real to be kept private? We don't have answers to that question. It's a deep question that ultimately will have to be decided. Uh, the Times article yesterday started out with a person who killed his wife and was later found to have a cyst in his brain. It also refers to the Texas Tower sniper, a man who was killed by the police trying to stop him from shooting in the Texas Tower. And when his brain was examined, it was found that he had a tumor in his brain. Unfortunately, there's no way to know which is cause, which is effect, and which is artifact. So there are a lot of people walking around with cysts in their brain that we never visualize, who are not killing people and not pushing their lives off the 
very hard to know whether pathology in the brain is something that needs to be disclosed to the criminal authorities or to the medical authorities or to neither. Suppose you had a way to understand that with this person's genes and their lifestyle and that small hippocampus in their brain, they're very vulnerable to suicide. Should they be under house arrest or surveillance for the rest of their lives? And how much are we willing to put up with in order to save their lives? We don't have answers for those questions. And here's one I thought was, was ex extreme in, and excessive. The article in the Times yesterday said, Florida court has held that failure to admit neuroscience evidence during sentencing is grounds for reversal of the trial. Mm. I just find that, I would say, laughable if it weren't such a serious mistake. This is far worse than hanging chats ever had imagined. Mm. And the real issue, we don't, we don't know what neuroscience evidence would be grounds for reversal. I think that's a flagrant and irrational kind of objection. The Times said, if the prefrontal cortex turns out to be critical for selecting more punishments among jurors, should all jurors be required to have such a test before they pick a jury? Now, my little clue is that if the sentence starts with if, <coughs> you don't need to worry about it because it's not going to happen many times. But what I've learned from the President's counsel is that people who don't know very much science and hear the word starting with if take that as a serious proposition. And that if you gave an inch, you would suddenly find yourself on a slippery slope to a disastrous decision that can't be reversed. I think these are all highly irrational ideas. Enhancing the brain. Well, how many people take Ritalin to study, for example? Have you close your eyes and raise hands? <laughs> well, when I was a student, we took amphetamine. It was readily available to take amphetamine. So we, we take drugs to enhance our brains, at least for the short term, all the time. On some weekends, you may take other drugs to de-enhance your brains. <laughs> they're all legal. Therefore, our government makes money off of the sale of alcoholic beverages. Devices, we have calculators. We have digital watches. How many people understand the concept of counterclockwise? So, digital watches. So, voluntarily, we as a society are willing to take drugs and use devices that will enhance the capabilities of our brain. And things that haven't been defined yet, like the Apple iPhone. If you were willing to have something transplanted into your body, it is possible that if you had the cornea of a snake, you could suddenly sense infrared colors. You could be a heat detector. You could be a far more effective soldier than any soldier that we have today. Uh, bionic people with xenophobic transplants of special conditions could enhance the body. Whether our Defense Department will think of that any time in the future is unfortunately unpredictable. But the real problem comes with involuntary treatments. Are, are we willing to say that this person has a weak mind and therefore we must imprison them? Are we willing to say that this person's diminishment is to society's disadvantage and it's better to try to physically intervene to do something for them? Um, involuntary treatments like Clockwork Orange, if you remember that ancient movie, um, are, are held to be societally unacceptable. So let me just leave you with this one, which the Times article yesterday went into in great length. It uses the positron emission tomography to ask what different parts of the brain light up when a person makes a moral decision. And everybody in this task was asked to decide what they would do under these two possibilities. One is that you're standing near a train track. Five people are in the path of the train. The train is going to kill them if you don't hit the switch. If you hit the switch, the train will veer off to the side, but on the side track, there's one person standing. So if you save the five, you're going to kill them. And everybody says, well, let's hit the switch. Save five, this one. Give them the same kind of question and say, you're standing on a bridge going across the train tracks next to a fat man. Five people on the track. 
Is it better to push the fat man off the bridge and stop the train or let him kill the five people? Well, here people are very, very mixed. It turns out in analyzing this problem, what they find is that when you make the personal decision to push the fat man off the bridge, this part, the medial frontal cortex and the posterior cingulate cortex light up. When you make the impersonal decision to throw the switch, the dorsal lateral cortex and the posterior parietal cortex light up. So totally different wares in the brain when you're making this moral decision. So the impersonal decision, an abstract thing in which you're really not involved except for touching the switch, lights up an area where you can be very rational about the morality of the future. But when you're actually engaging yourself in making the personal decision to act, different parts of your brain light up. Now that's very interesting. The question is, what would happen in real life instead of under this hypothetical brain? Can you really be devoid of personal activity in your real life? One of the people who was quoted in the New York Times article, I think this is almost a fitting end, but I had a couple of quick slides to show you. Stephen Morse, who is a person at the University of Pennsylvania who talks on neuroethics and neuroscience and law a lot, he says, neuroscience can never identify the mysterious point at which people should be excused from responsibility for their actions because they are not able, in some sense, to control themselves. That question is moral and ultimately legal, and it must be answered not in laboratories like this, but in courtrooms and legislatures. In other words, we as a society have to answer this ourselves. Now, I, I thought that I could take the normal yin and yang and, and represent the tug of war between science and society in this world. Now, generally, we think ethically that society is telling scientists not to do something that might ultimately be bad. But in fact, the way I see it from the scientist's point of view, society is actually demanding of science cures for the problems that face us in everyday life. So finding the right tip of balance between science and society is really what ethical considerations are all about. Two weeks ago, the New York Times Magazine dealt with why is it that no matter what religion we choose to practice, our brains that are capable of all this conscience creative thought are all geared to believe in a supernatural being. And it predates, by a long shot, Judaism and Christianity, goes back to the prehistoric times. And it is thought by philosophers and evolutionists that in order to give the brain the properties that we've talked about, that allow for conscious thinking, creative thought, that we're also vulnerable, prone to believing and things that make life a good story. That the left side of your brain wants to narrate a positive future for you, and a positive leader who can get you to believe that if you only practice life this way, you will live a long and fruitful life. A philosopher named Zeman looks at consciousness as tying together all these things, the arts, religion, unconscious reactions, artificial intelligence, normal and altered states, all of which go into aspects of approaching consciousness, which remains the number one problem. And you can look at it finally in this way, that ethics is what we ought to do. Laws give us what we have to do. And when you're in an operational state, like a scientist or a physician, you have to decide whether you need to take the risk to break an ethical rule, certainly not a legal rule, in order to help that patient. So those are my thoughts, Larry, on neuroscience and research. Thank you. A little bit of time for questions? Yes, of course. Uh, let me open the floor to questions. There's a lot to ask you. Uh, going back to your discussion about the Florida court uh, overturning a decision when they refused to admit neuroscience evidence, and considering that quote from Morse that it should be up to the legislatures and the courts to determine where that moral line is drawn. Where do you stand with allowing lay people, i.e. juries, to consider these complicated ideas? Well, I think it's a, it's a very risky state because the jurors are not picked for their experience or background. Oftentimes they're picked because they don't have a particular experience or background. So to let jurors decide this kind of thing, I think, is, is a very risky thing. 
precedent in law means that juries get overturned by appellate courts where juries are not often involved. So the, the whole legal process is a matter of deferring decision to a higher authority and always being reversed. But I don't, hey, I don't know that that's really the case as it was reported in the New York Times article, that it is grounds for reversal. But I thought it was a very flagrant statement to lay out for you. I'm sure we'll see in the letters to the editor over the next couple of weeks whether it is or it isn't true. But I think you raise a very good point that because of the way the legal system works, jury trials can be overturned by higher authorities. That Oliver Wendell Holmes' view of the law was that precedent is established first by a jury, and then the envelope is pushed by the appellate court systems after that. And only those decisions that are reinforced or confirmed get to be part of the legal body of the law. Adam? You gave us an example. If you are born with red color blindness, you're expected to conform by noticing whether, you know, which light is lit up. And I'm not sure exactly what point you had in mind, but I would think there would be a significant difference to say the person you mentioned has the capability of conforming to social norms, so they're supposed to do it. If the brain problem affected their ability to conform to social norms, would that be a different example than the one you had in mind? Well, I was using it as a sensory deficit to be a placeholder for a more complex form of cognitive processing deficit. And so my position is exactly that. You have to be aware of your own cognitive blind spots and live a responsible life aware that you have certain deficiencies in what you're able to do. Okay, so if the blind spot were your ability to identify your own rage, right, then it would be harder to hold you responsible if the defect went to your ability to monitor. It may be harder, but it would be less of society's responsibility and more of that person's responsibility to understand. That's what anger management courses help people recognize, is when you're starting up the slope of becoming irate, that you've got to control that. You know, I think part of the difference between the two cases is that the workaround in the case of the red traffic signal is pretty straightforward and easy, whereas the workaround in terms of rage is something that requires a fair amount of effort and self-reflection. Absolutely. You know, harder to achieve. Is it, when you were talking about using the brain imaging, or I think it was the P300 to recognize someone, is it possible for you to not remember somebody, not remember their face, but will your brain like activate if you see a face that you remember? Absolutely, or the same face under a different set of images may look completely different. Okay, but it's kind of like a basic thing of actual recognition, not consciously. Let me give you a thought question. You've had friends who've grown beards, and suddenly they come back from summer, and they don't have the beard anymore, and you still don't know who that same person is. Well, I mean, I would kind of recognize that, like, oh, that's, you know, whoever with the beard. Right, but do you recognize them that they didn't have a beard? It's happened to me several times that people say, you didn't even notice that I shaved my beard. Now, us old guys get gray whiskers, so we shave those off. And I guess, are they making any progress with using that as a lie detector? Because it would seem like a fairly effective method to do it. You can distinctly measure it. So far, it's not been accepted by the courts, because the scientific people, other than the ones who sell the P300s as lie detectors, the scientific body is dead set against allowing it to be the case. The National Research Council, part of the National Academy of Sciences, did a very extensive report on why lie detectors are fallacious. Okay, so there's no FBI things going on under the table? Well, that's a different issue. It may well be, and certainly CIA and other kinds of people who don't have to obey court rules can apply these things. In the example of the train and, like, killing five individuals to the one in comparison to pushing somebody over off a bridge to stop a train, for me, it would be like my intuition would be more that people would not want to push the person, because then you'd be using the person strictly as a means to stop a car, whereas in the first situation, the individual who would die would be more of a consequence of a bad situation. So wouldn't it be less about... It's less emotional. Well, not that it's less emotional, less about, like, the personal... Like, wouldn't it be less about the person's 
inner decision and more about whether and how they're using the second person or if they're using the second yeah, person? I think you make a very good point. The, the conclusion I <coughs> gave you was the one that the authors of the paper drew. And so they, put, they looked across all the subjects that they gave this kind of task to, and they decided it was the personal involvement that was the, the major thing, not so much the consequence, actually. But I, I can see you. Yes, ma'am. Because this, and that would apply to war too, pushing a button versus shooting a person. Yes. And so, what happens to the brain if they shot a given number of people? They just get better at Shoot camping people. down that feeling. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you know, pushing the button, we do this all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And we just get well, about it. Well, if you're a buff of Civil War history, and you understand what happened when musket loaders became rifles and how it became easier and easier to kill people. And you hear the stories of the soldiers. During war, when everyone is killing everyone, it's a relatively easy bad habit to get into. But when they come back from war, and certainly that's the case with our veterans today, post-traumatic stress disorder from the experiences of the war ruin the rest of their lives or can ruin the rest of their lives. So pushing the button is preferable. I mean, I mean, in terms of the aftermath, well, yeah, that's one of those slippery slope for yeah. home. Yeah. Yeah. Not, not having the war would be a better solution. Yeah, well, I quite agree. I quite agree. But given where we are, it, it, it doesn't apply to that case, too? Well, I, I think that's an issue that, that ethicists would love to discuss. Ethicists, you know, no offense <laughs> intended, ethicists seem to love to discuss everything and never reach a decision. <laughs> <laughs> or at least agree on it. Exactly. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Have a good course.